Welcome to Dialogue for Health and today's web forum, Lung Cancer Screening, an Overview of Medicare, Medicaid, and Private Insurance Coverage. We thank the partner and sponsors for this event, the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School, the LUCA National Training Network, and the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation. My name is Laura Burr, and I'm running today's web forum with my colleague, Kathy Piazza. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Celeste Worth. Celeste has over 20 years of experience in cancer control and provider education. She is the director of the LUCA National Training Network, a national center for provider education based at the University of Louisville, and was previously a co-investigator for the provider education component of a statewide lung cancer research project. Ms. Worth is a Master Certified Health Education Specialist, as well as a Tobacco Treatment Specialist. Welcome to Dialogue for Health Celeste. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar in our two-part series, Addressing Lung Cancer Screening and Tobacco Cessation Coverage. As Laura said, I'm Celeste Worth, Director of the LUCA National Training Network at the University of Louisville. Before Katie's presentation, I'd like to briefly share a little bit about our organization and how we may be a resource to your work in lung cancer care and how the new resources being shared with you today have become developed. LUCA National Training Network was established following the work of the University of Louisville Provider Education component of the Kentucky Leeds Collaborative. Due to the success of our efforts with statewide provider education across the lung cancer care continuum, our funder, Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation, requested that we provide our training, materials, and lessons learned on a national scale. As a result, LUCA National Training Network was formed and focuses on providing training and resources for those who are educating primary care providers about lung cancer care, as well as for providers and other professionals directly. Examples of our training programs include our comprehensive online course and webinars like the one today. We have tools for use by providers as well as patients, with more we are currently developing. All are or will be available for download from our website, lucatraining.org. Lastly, we can provide technical assistance for those such as health systems, medical societies, or professional organizations who would like to provide various types of training or education to primary care or other referring providers. Through our work to date, it has been apparent that there are many issues and questions surrounding coverage for lung cancer screening, shared decision making, tobacco cessation counseling, and medications. LUCA has been very fortunate to partner with Katie Garfield and the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation, another Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation grantee, to provide this timely set of resources to help answer many coverage questions and help users to find the latest information on these topics, especially as coverage changes occur going forward. So now I would like to go forward with Katie's introduction and presentation. So, Katie is a clinical instructor at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation at Harvard Law School. Katie joined the center in 2014 and currently focuses her work on the center's whole person care initiatives, including the center's food is medicine and specialty care projects. In her work on these initiatives, she has had the opportunity to work with community-based organizations, state agencies, health care providers, and coalitions to develop strategies to increase access to innovative health care services. Prior to joining the center, Katie was an associate at Ropes and Gray LLP. She is a licensed member of the Massachusetts Bar. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Katie. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Celeste, for that introduction. Uh, as Celeste mentioned, oh, let me advance the slide here. Um, as Celeste mentioned, I'm an attorney and a clinical instructor for the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School. For those of you who aren't, aren't familiar at all with our work, uh, we are a dual mission organization. Uh, we act both as a technical advisor to organize, organizations really across the country who are trying to navigate healthcare laws and regulations to improve care for vulnerable populations. We are also a clinical program of Harvard Law School, meaning that we act as a training center for future healthcare lawyers and advocates. We've had the pleasure of working with Celeste and the LUCA National Training Network as part of our role as a, 
as a technical assistance provider to grantees of the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation's Bridging Cancer Care Initiative. In my part of the presentation today, I'm going to walk you through the background and content for the new resource that we've developed as part of our work with LUCA. The name of that resource, which you'll see many times today, is Lung Cancer Screening, Understanding Medicaid, Medicare, and Private Insurance Coverage. To begin, I'd like to just give you a brief overview of the goals of this project uh, for a bit of context. So as Celeste sort of outlined, uh, LUCA works with organizations across the country, um, and they may receive questions regarding issues related to coverage, costs, and billing requirements for lung cancer screening. These questions come from a variety of individuals and in, in institutions, and especially from individuals in roles like patient navigation, uh, which it sounds like is really well represented on the webinar today, so that's fantastic. Uh, to help Luca to answer these questions, we have developed a resource that provides basic information regarding coverage um, for these services and how to research potential changes to that coverage. We see this second component as particularly important. We know that policies related to lung cancer screening can and do evolve over time. We therefore believe it is important to both provide some basic information about the current state of coverage and to help readers understand where they can go to access up-to-date, accurate information as coverage policies change. To the greatest extent possible, you'll see that we provide useful hyperlinks and citations throughout the resource to make this research process as easy as possible. And I'll state at the outset here that we do hope to update this document on a periodic basis moving forward, but we hope that these research-oriented components will empower readers to seek out their own answers whenever they face uncertainty. Here, let's dig in into the actual content of this resource. Again, the title of the resource is Lung Cancer Screening, Understanding Medicaid, Medicare, and Private Insurance Coverage. The resource is broken into four parts. In part one, we provide an overview of the current status of coverage for lung cancer screening services in Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurance plans. In part two, we then provide strategies for conducting additional research regarding these programs. In part three, we answer frequently asked questions regarding coverage, costs, and coding, with a particular focus in this section often on the Medicare program where that can be particularly crucial for this service. Finally, in part four, uh, we provide a list of additional resources that readers can turn to to learn more about this topic. So today I'm going to give an overview of each of these four parts, but you can visit the LUCA website to review the resource and learn more. To begin, let's just briefly review the basics of the lung cancer screening process. Uh, so, as many of you likely know, if a healthcare provider believes that a patient may be a candidate for lung cancer screening, they will likely ask the, the patient a series of questions to decide whether or not the patient meets basic screening guidelines, and we'll talk a lot more about those guidelines later on today. Uh, if the patient does meet eligibility requirements, the patient and the provider will then go through a process of shared decision making in which they go over the benefits and risks of screening and determine if the patient would like to move forward with the screening process. If through a shared decision making process the patient does decide to be screened, uh, they will receive a referral for the actual screening service. Uh, screening consists here of a low dose CT scan. Depending upon the results, there will be follow-up steps, so the provider may suggest follow-up diagnostic testing, or if the scan is negative, the provider may recommend the individual return for annual screenings in the future. So those are the basics of what a patient could expect in their interactions with a healthcare provider. However, of course, we know that there is an important key third party in all of this, the patient's health insurance payer. When going through the shared decision-making and lung cancer screening process, a key question on the patient's mind will, of course, be, will my health insurance plan pay for this? Uh, this question is really the focus of the, our resource. We have looked at federal laws, regulations, and guidance to try to determine what insurance coverage will look like for patients across a spectrum of health insurance payers. In particular, we have focused on the payers described on this slide. We have broken these payers into two broad categories, public payers and private payers. I'm sure that many of you on the webinar are already familiar with these payers, but bear with me as I give just a really brief overview to ensure that we all have a 
common understanding before we discuss greater details about these programs. So on the public payer side, we have two major public insurance programs, Medicaid and Medicare. Within Medicaid, we have two categories of coverage. Um, specifically, we have traditional Medicaid, um, which is what we typically think of Medicaid, including coverage for low-income families, children, pregnant women, elderly, and people with disabilities. And then we have the Medicaid expansion population. This is, of course, the new optional coverage category established by the Affordable Care Act. Under this option, states can provide Medicaid coverage to adults with incomes up to 138% of federal poverty level. It's important to be aware of these two populations because there will be distinctions in coverage between them, as we'll talk about in a moment. Then we have Medicare. So Medicare is our primary public insurance program for individuals age 65 and over, some disabled individuals, and individuals living with end-stage renal disease or ALS. Individuals in the Medicare program can receive coverage in two ways. First, uh, via original Medicare, also known as Medicare Part A and B, where coverage is directly managed by the federal government. Then we have Medicare Advantage, also known as Medicare Part C. Eligibility for Medicare Advantage is the same as for Medicare Original, but Medicare Advantage is delivered by private insurance plans rather than directly by the federal government. About a third of Medicare participants are enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans. Again, it's important to be aware of these distinctions as there may be some slight differences between Original Medicare and the Medicare Advantage program. Then on the private insurer side, uh, we, have a group, we have both group insurance and individual insurance. And then finally, some other categories of coverage such as short-term health insurance plans. Group insurance is health insurance delivered to members of the group, so such as employees of an organization, while individual insurance is purchased directly by an individual, generally on a state or federal marketplace. Then we have short-term insurance. So short-term insurance is a form of temporary insurance that's really meant to fill gaps in coverage, such as when someone's between jobs. Um, we have included this category in our resource because we are increasingly seeing individuals use short-term insurance as a primary form of coverage, and notably, it's really not subject to the same requirements and protections as other forms of coverage. So we thought that it was important to bring this into the resource and distinguish the ways um, that short-term insurance coverage may be different than other private insurance coverage. On this slide, you'll see uh, really the heart of part one of our resource, which is a very high-level overview of coverage for lung cancer screening and shared decision-making in each of these categories of coverage I've just described. I'm going to run through each of these categories briefly, uh, but please note a few caveats up front. Uh, first, the resource describes general rules for what coverage should look like. Um, and we know that gaps in implementation do occur, and some rules allow for some flexibility. So we always note that when in doubt, our advice is to consult with the individual plan or plan documents. Additionally, uh, when we discuss cost sharing here, we do mean cost sharing for the screening and shared decision making itself. In some cases, uh, patients may find themselves subject to other costs, such as costs for additional services that they received at the same time as the screening, um, costs for office visits if the primary purpose of the visit was not a screening service, um, or in some cases, things like facility fees. Um, so keep the caveats in mind, but now I'm just going to really briefly run through this table, and I'm not going to cover everything here because there's a lot of detail, but we're just going to run through it briefly, and then I'll dig more into it in our next slide. So here again, you see that we're addressing Medicaid, Medicare, and then private insurance. Within Medicaid, we have our traditional population and our Medicaid expansion population. As you can see, uh, coverage and cost sharing for lung cancer screening and shared decision making varies across Medicaid traditional programs. And we'll talk about why that is in just a moment. Then in the Medicaid expansion program, we see much more consistent requirements around coverage. Individuals in the Medicaid expansion program should have coverage of lung cancer screening, um, specifically for adults who are aged 55 to 80 years, who have a, at least a 30-pack year smoking history, and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. These individuals should receive lung cancer screening without cost sharing. Then we see in the Medicare program a similarly consistent approach to coverage um, in both 
original Medicare and Medicare Advantage, patients should have access to both lung cancer screening and shared decision making. Um, you'll see that the population covered is slightly different for Medicare than Medicaid, uh, especially around the ages involved. So in Medicare, individuals aged 55 to 77 years uh, with no signs or symptoms of lung cancer who have at least a 30-year pack, 30 pack year smoking history and currently smoke or have quit within the last 15 years and who receive a written order for screening um, are eligible uh, for coverage for lung cancer screening and shared decision making. Similar to the Medicaid expansion population, there should be no cost sharing associated with these services. Then we see the private insurance side. Um, here first we can take a look at the group and individual coverage. Um, again, here note that we are focusing on what are called non-grandfathered plans. So these are most plans in the group and individual market and we'll talk about what I mean by grandfather a bit later on. So for non-grandfathered group and individual plans, there should be coverage um, for lung cancer screening. Uh, again, similar uh, population to the one that we saw in Medicaid. It's for adults aged 55 to 80 years who have a 30-pack year smoking history and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. Uh, this coverage should be provided without cost sharing. Finally, you'll see the short-term health insurance plans. Again, my warning up front was that for these plans, the preventive service coverage requirements that really guide a lot of this coverage do not apply to short-term health insurance plans. And so coverage is really going to vary, as will cost sharing in that category of plans. So I know that that was a lot of information to sort of digest, and as you saw, there were even details within each of those programs uh, that I didn't even go into. But you can easily go back to the resource and see those additional details. And now I'm actually gonna walk through uh, part two of our resource that talks a bit about how you're able to do research in these, in these programs and it gives you a bit more context for how those coverage and cost sharing requirements came about. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we know that medical advances and new legal requirements may alter the coverage landscape. Um, our part two of the resource is really meant to provide strategies and resources for conducting your own research to determine the current status of coverage for lung cancer screening services. For the purposes of our webinar today, this will also give you some background on that coverage slide I just provided. Um, first, the resource looks at Medicaid. Uh, in Medicaid, coverage and cost sharing for lung cancer screening will really depend on two key factors. First which Medicaid population your patient falls into, whether that be traditional Medicaid or Medicaid expansion, and second, what rating the United States Preventive Services Task Force currently gives to lung cancer screening. For the first question, you'll have to really determine whether you're operating in a Medicaid expansion state. That is, whether your state has decided to expand Medicaid eligibility to all adults with incomes up to 138% of the federal poverty level. On this slide and in the resource, uh, you'll see a link to a really great resource on this piece. Uh, that's the Kaiser Family Foundation Status of State Medicaid Expansion Decisions Interactive Map. This map is regularly updated and shows which states have expanded Medicaid. So say that you know you are operating in a Medicaid expansion state. Well, what does that specifically mean for coverage? Well, under the Affordable Care Act, states must cover all preventive services that receive an A or B rating from the United States Preventive Services Task Force, also known as the USPFTS, and I'll just say that for the rest of the presentation, um, without cost sharing for their Medicaid expansion population. So the USPFTS currently provides a B rating to lung cancer screening. Specifically, the USPFTS recommends lung cancer screening for adults aged 55 to 80 years who have a 30-pack year smoking history and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. So if an individual is in that Medicaid expansion population and they meet these criteria, they should be able to receive lung cancer screening without cost sharing. In contrast, states have the option to cover these USPSTS A and B rated preventive services for that traditional Medicaid population. Because this coverage is optional, it's going to vary from state to state. I wish I could give you a clear, direct answer on this, but it really will require research in your individual state to understand what 
they have decided to do for that more traditional Medicaid population. In either case, the USPSCF rating can play a really important role in driving and determining coverage. Um, but I would say you have to keep in mind that USPSTF recommendations can change over time. When that happens, plans have a little over a year to adjust their coverage to meet the new recommendation. And so I want to note here at the outset that we know that lung cancer screening, that recommendation under the USPSTF is currently under review and will likely be updated in the next year or so. Therefore, it's important to understand where to find the current USPSTF recommendations and stay up to date. Over the next few slides, we'll walk you briefly through the process you would go through to find that updated recommendation. First, you would go to the USPSTF website. The URL is provided here. On the website, there are a few ways to find recommendations. One easy way is to use the search bar that is available right there on the home page and circled on this slide. As of yesterday, if you search for the term lung cancer, you will see two recommendations appear, the current recommendation from 2013 and an upcoming recommendation that we expect to see probably sometime in 2020. Uh, the current recommendation is what matters for coverage right now. So you would click on that, and as you can see, USCFCS provides a B rating to lung cancer screening, again, for individuals aged 55 to 80 years who have a 30-pack year smoking history and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. It also notes a couple of caveats here, noting that screening should be discontinued once a person has not smoked for 15 years or developed a health problem that substantially limits life expectancy or the ability or willingness to have curative lung surgery. Again, all Medicaid expansion enrollees who meet those criteria should be able to receive screening without any cost sharing. States then have the option to cover this service for individuals outside of the expansion population. Next, let's take a quick look at researching coverage in the Medicare program. This is probably the most important source of coverage for lung cancer screening, and so we probably give it the most attention in the resource, I would say. Um, in the Medicare program, the details of coverage for lung cancer screening are really going to depend primarily on three things. First, the USPSTF rating we've just discussed. Second, the Medicare National Coverage Determination, or NCD, and Medicare manuals and transmittals. The federal Medicare statute outlines a few specific preventive services that Medicare must cover. Then, the statute gives the Secretary of Health and Human Services the option to choose to cover additional preventive services. Specifically, the Secretary may cover preventive services that are, first, reasonable and necessary for the prevention or early detection of an illness or disability, second, recommended with a grade a of A or B by the USPSCS, again, USPSCS playing a key role here, and Third, appropriate for individuals entitled to benefits under Part A of Medicare or enrolled under Part B. Um, if the preventive service meets these criteria, the secretary can choose to cover that service by issuing what's called a national coverage determination. By issuing a national coverage determination, HHS establishes nationwide coverage for the preventive service um, in both original Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Notably, neither program original Medicare nor Medicare Advantage um, may charge cost sharing for these preventive services. So the other important thing about that national coverage determination document is it contains important details regarding patient eligibility and billing requirements for the service. So it's really under important to understand where to find that um, and to be able to easily get at the details contained there. So how would you determine whether Medicare covers lung cancer screening? Well, you would go or find that national coverage determination. You would go to the national coverage determination database on cms.gov. You can see the URL for this database on the slide. Uh, you could then use the search feature to search for coverage determinations for lung cancer. When you find the national coverage determination, you will see that Medicare has chosen to cover lung cancer screening for individuals who are first age 55 to 77, again, that being a key difference between Medicare and other programs, a slightly narrower age range. Um, these individuals must be asymptomatic, meaning they show no signs or symptoms of lung cancer. They must have at least a 30-pack year smoking history, 
they must currently smoke or have quit within the last 15 years, and importantly, they must receive a written order for screening. Uh, the NCD also outlines many additional requirements that Medicare imposes on lung cancer screening. For example, the NCD requires that patients receive a shared decision-making visit prior to their first screening and that this visit meets certain criteria. Finally, I just want to note that CMS also provides additional details regarding coverage requirements through its Medicare manuals. These manuals really cover a range of topics and can be found fairly easily online on the URLs provided here. Uh, the manuals that are probably most important to researching lung cancer include the Medicare National Coverage Determination Manual that captures those NCDs we've just talked about, um, the Medicare Claims Processing Manual, especially Chapter 18 on preventive and screening services, and for individuals in the Medicare Advantage Program, the Medicare Managed Care Manual, especially Chapter 4 around benefits and beneficiary protection. CMS periodically makes updates to the content of these important manuals. To do so, it issues what's called a change request transmittal. These transmittals are important documents because they're, they officially signal changes in policy to key actors in the Medicare system, including Medicare administrative contractors who are responsible for processing and paying Medicare claims across the country. CMS keeps an archive of these transmittals at the URL provided on this slide. At this point, there are a couple of key transmittals related to lung cancer screening. These include transmittal 3374, 185, and 3901. And let me just note, I know I'm throwing out a lot of different documents here. One of the great things about the resource is that we have these documents all uh, mentioned in the resource with live links that can take you directly to them. So no need to sort of scramble or write them down. They're all right there and easy to access. And finally, let's just take a brief look at how you would research current coverage and cost sharing for lung cancer screening services in a private insurance plan. Coverage under private plans often depends on a couple of key factors. First, once again, whether or not the service has received an A or B rating from the USPS TF. Second, whether the plan you are looking at is considered to be a grandfathered plan under the Affordable Care Act. And third, whether the plan actually qualifies um, as individual or group coverage or if it falls into some other category, um, especially a short-term plan. And that's what we'll talk about in just a moment. So why does the US PSTS rating matter for private plans? Well, like the Medicaid expansion plans, most private insurance plans must cover USPSTF A and B rated services without cost sharing. This means that most private insurance plans, so those individual and group plans, must cover lung cancer screening for individuals meeting the USPSTF recommendation. So again, as a reminder, that's individuals between the ages of 55 to 80 who have at least a 30-pack year smoking history and who currently smoke or have quit within the last 15 years. So generally, broad coverage of lung cancer screening should occur in the private market. However, there are, of course, always exceptions to this rule. Um, a big one would be grandfathered plans. So grandfathered plans are plans that existed at the time the Affordable Care Act was enacted in 2010 and which really haven't significantly changed since that time. Grandfathered plans are not subject to many of the key requirements of the Affordable Care Act, including the requirement to cover USCSDF A and B rated preventive services. A number of events can cause a plan to lose its grandfathered status, um, and so the number of grandfathered plans sort of out there in the world is hopefully declining over time, um, making this less and less of an issue, we hope. So changes that would trigger this would include things like eliminating all or substantially all benefits to diagnose or treat a particular condition, or certain increases to cost sharing requirements. Of course, your question is, how do I determine um, if a plan is considered grandfathered? Well, you can contact the individual plan. Those plans are required to disclose information regarding their grandfather status. So you should be able to find this out from the plan materials or by contacting the plan directly. A second important exception to this sort of private insurance-based rule for coverage would be short-term plans. Increasingly, patients may be using these short-term plans as a primary source of coverage because they're often cheaper than normal individual or group plans. This trend is problematic because these plans are not subject 
to many of the requirements that the Affordable Care Act imposes on other forms of private insurance, including the requirement to cover these preventive services. Um, because short-term plans are not required to cover USPSTF A and B rated preventive services, coverage and cost sharing in these plans is going to vary massively for lung cancer screening. Um, and so you would have to contact the individual plan to learn more. Again, if you're uncertain of whether a plan is sort of a more standard individual or group plan versus a short-term plan, uh, you would have to contact the plan or look at individual plan documents. Um, this is our, oh, sorry, our third section of the resource, our frequently asked questions section. Um, on this slide, you'll see the range of questions currently addressed in the FAQs. They range from broad questions like, what if a patient lacks insurance? What is prior authorization? And what if screening is delivered by an out-of-network provider? Uh, we also have more specific questions. Again, these kind of focus in more on Medicare, um, including who must make the referral to lung cancer screening for Medicare enrollees? What if screening is delivered by an independent diagnostic testing, a diagnostic testing facility, or IDTF? This is a key issue in Medicare coverage right now, so we've chosen to include it uh, in the resource. And then finally, what codes must I provide when billing original Medicare for lung cancer screening? I'm not going to go through all of those questions right now. I just want to go briefly through one or two to give you a sense of the types of things that are covered in the resource. Um, if you see a question in this list, though, that really uh, interests you, uh, you can always go to the resource itself or feel free to bring it up during the Q&A section at the end of this webinar. So let's cover one quick example of the broader questions included in the FAQs. One question that commonly comes up is what if screening is delivered by an out-of-network provider, meaning a healthcare provider that is not part of the network of providers that the patient's health plan contracts with to deliver care. So if any part of the screening process, whether it be shared decision-making, radiology, the screening facility, et cetera, um, is delivered by a, a provider that is outside the patient's plan network, the patient may very well face additional out-of-pocket costs. So this is a really important question from our patient side. For example, the Affordable Care Act does not require private insurance plans to cover USPSCF A and B rated services provided by out-of-network providers unless that plan does not have in-network providers that can deliver the benefit. Similarly, individuals in Medicare, for example, individuals in Medicare Advantage, may similarly face cost sharing if they receive lung cancer screening services outside of their plan network. Secondly, let's just take a quick look at an example of some of the more Medicare-specific FAQs contained in the resource. So one question that we've seen come up a lot in the Medicare space is who must make the referral to lung cancer screening? There is confusion on this point due to some conflicting information described in some of the CMS resources that we talked about earlier today. So a 2015 MLN Matters publication stated that screening had to be ordered by a primary care provider in a primary care setting. However, some of the other documents we've talked about, so the National Coverage Decision and the CMS Manuals, really took a broader approach on this issue, stating that the referral must just be made by a physician or non-physician provider during a shared decision-making visit for the first screen and any appropriate visit for subsequent annual screenings. Uh, in response to this conflict, several professional groups asked for clarification. In response, CMS clarified that the referral does not need to come from a primary care provider, but that the physician or non-physician practitioner who furnishes the shared decision-making visit and orders the lung cancer screening uh, must be treating the beneficiary and use the results in the management of the beneficiary's specific medical problem to ensure improved health outcomes. So again, does not have to be a primary care physician in a primary care setting, but it does have to be someone who is treating the beneficiary and uses the results in management for that patient. And then finally, we're running short on time, so I don't really want to walk all the way through this in detail, but I just wanted to finish my overview of the FAQs by highlighting that uh, this section of the resource does provide a table that outlines key coding requirements for both lung cancer screening and shared decision making um, when billing the original Medicare program. Uh, this section also contains live links to the CMS resources that provide a lot of additional details on these requirements. And we really suggest that anybody who is looking um, to bill the original Medicare program, so 
uh, Medicare administrative contractors for these services uh, to take a look at these documents first and consult, of course, with your billing department um, on requirements. And then finally, I just wanted to note that the resource ends in part four uh, with a table of additional resources. So we at Chilpi and Luca recognize that we can't possibly fit in everything that you might need to know about lung cancer screening into what is a 10-page resource. Uh, therefore, this section essentially allows us to point you to additional resource, resources that are out there from advocacy organizations, healthcare providers, professional associations, and really a whole slew of experts uh, that can help to build your knowledge of lung cancer screening and coverage for screening services. For example, in this table, you see a couple of great web pages that are operated by the American College of Radiology. Um, the ACR has an excellent FAQs page that covers a range of issues related to lung, lung cancer screening um, and billing. Uh, additionally, the ACR has another page that pulls together broader resources on lung cancer screening, including things like shared decision aids, uh, and information on screening best practices. Similar helpful resources can be found from the Association of Community Cancer Centers, um, as well as the GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. And this section is just the, is, I would like to note that this section is the uh, final section of the resource and so the final piece of my presentation. However, I do want to take a moment here at the end just to highlight a key point about the resource. Uh, as Celeste will explain in a moment, this resource will be available online, and it's really meant to be kind of a living, interactive document. It's filled with hyperlinks to all of the resources I've described here today, and I'm hoping to really update it as periodically as we move forward. So if there are issues that you would like to see addressed in future iterations or key outside resources that ought to be highlighted in this last additional resources section, I would encourage you uh, to let us know. We aim to keep the resource short and digestible to make it as easy as easily to use as possible, but if there are key issues and resources that we're missing, we're of course happy to make a note and consider including them in the next version of uh, this resource. And now I'm gonna hand things back over to Celeste uh, to give you a bit of information on where you can find the uh, resource itself. Okay, thank you so much, Katie, for a terrific presentation and certainly a timely and helpful overview of these really key issues. Uh, you all have clearly done a great deal of research at Chilpi to bring all of this together in one resource. The resource that all of you have heard about today, focused on coverage for lung cancer screening and related shared decision making, is available on the LUCA website at lucatraining.org under tools. We will be hosting another webinar discussing the second and third resources in this series on tobacco cessation and medication coverage at the same time, 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock Eastern Time and 11 to 12 Pacific Time on Tuesday, November 19th. Please mark your calendars and spread the word. Another email will be sent to all participants on today's webinar with the link to register for the next webinar. If you would like any additional information, please contact us by email at lucatraining at louisville.edu or by calling our toll-free number 844-LUCA-NTN for National Training Network. And so with that, I also want to make sure everyone's aware of our free online course, Lung Cancer and the Primary Care Provider. It's the first of its kind covering the entire lung cancer care continuum from prevention through early detection with screening, shared decision making, follow-up of results, uh, treatment advances, all the way through survivorship care. It's primarily video-based. It's featuring animated scenarios for provider discussions with patients about screening and cessation. It provides free CME nurse practitioner and American Academy of Family Physician prescribed credit with three separate lessons that can be done individually if desired. Anyone can participate in the online course and we hope you will share this comprehensive continuing education resource with providers, especially those treating at risk for or those diagnosed with lung cancer. So at this time, we would like to, and I just will add also that you can access that course also at LUCA's website uh, or going directly to lucatraining.org slash course. Uh, 
Cheney. As we start, uh, I will say that the first one is, quote, that radiology code GO297 is not a covered code. I have asked how to get the code covered. I'm waiting for a review six to eight weeks. How can you get a plan to cover something that isn't already covered, like LODO CT lung cancer screening? So I would say uh, that the answer to this is going to depend on two things. So first, whether it's actually required to be covered, but the plan is incorrectly stating it isn't, or if it's actually not covered. So if you see that uh, you're talking, you're receiving this message um, from a plan, and we're talking about one of the categories where we've described in the webinar today that there are sort of federal requirements that mean that you really ought to have coverage uh, for lung cancer screening, I would recommend uh, appealing the decision. Uh, there's detailed information on, uh, for Medicare on Medicare.gov about how to file an appeal in Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Um, similar information should be available in your plan materials if you're in Medicaid or private insurance. Uh, this could also be a code question. The GO297 um, is specifically a, a, a code that's used in Medicare. It may be uh, that your plan is actually using a different code, so you might want to explore if that is the issue. Um, and then finally, if it's actually not covered, so say this is a Medicaid traditional population um, or some other population that doesn't automatically receive coverage, um, this is an opportunity for advocacy. We have seen successful advocacy happening, for example, at the state level to try and get Medicaid programs to cover lung cancer screening uh, for their traditional population. Um, sometimes this occurs directly through the Medicaid agency. They decide to cover it um, in response uh, to requests from healthcare providers in the general community, or it may happen through things like legislation, uh, where the state legislature states that their Medicaid program must cover lung cancer screening. So those are really the, two, the couple of options I would give on that question. Great. Thanks, Katie. And the next one I think that I can tackle, uh, this person has asked, are there false positives on early screening? And this has been a topic of, of much consideration and discussion in that the initial results that we had from the National Lung Screening Trial uh, have in, in many ways been either misinterpreted or reported in a more negative light than is truly accurate. So there is certainly a possibility of a false positive result with the LODO CT uh, scan for lung cancer screening. Uh, but the average false positive rate per screening found in the National Lung Screening Trial was actually 23.3 percent. Uh, and even in a retrospective analysis of that trial uh, using current clinical practice of structured reporting with lung RADs uh, to be discussed later uh, that, that we'll be covering in, in more detail as far as uh, tools available, uh, the false positive rate was actually 7.8 percent. Uh, so much lower than has been commonly reported uh, and certainly something that would be helpful for providers to be more clear on in terms of sharing potential uh, risk or concerns with their patients. So for our next question, uh, Katie, this person has asked, can LODO CT be covered if a person is high risk but does not meet U.S. Preventative Services Task Force criteria? So often I believe the answer to this question would be typically no. Um, it's going to depend on the individual insurer. Some private plans may go above and beyond ACA requirements and, and provide coverage uh, for a broader population, um, but many plans do stick to those uh, USPSTF criteria or in the Medicare program, of course, the Medicare criteria. Um, so if you have somebody that uh, is high risk but doesn't meet the USPSTF criteria, I would certainly reach out to the insurance plan before assuming there would be coverage. Um, and I know uh, this comes up in a couple of other questions, it's kind of a related issue, um, is this question about USPSTF criteria in the first place. Is there sort of movement on that? Could there be change? Um, as I noted earlier, uh, the lung cancer screening recommendation is currently under review, so there is a possibility that those criteria may change. Um, and so we'll have to wait and see, but we know that there are other sort of re other recommendations out there that may take into account a wider variety of risk factors. Um, so it's important to keep an eye on that USPSTF recommendation moving forward in case it does shift um, to provide more flexibility. Thank you so much, Celeste and Katie. And also, many thanks to the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School and the LUCA National Training Network. 
and the Bristol-Myers Squibb Foundation for sponsoring today's event. And thank you to you, our audience.